Good morning, Pleasant Green. Oh, how grateful and how thankful we are that you have gathered here again with us on this morning uh, by way of Facebook, YouTube, or our call-in line. We are so glad that you have decided to worship with us this morning. Listen, I know some of you out there are feeling uh, like you can finally breathe again, uh, like life is looking better again. And I want you to know that it does not matter what else is going on in the world. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. His word, it says to us that everything that has breath, if you're feeling like you have a new breath in your body, the Lord says everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Listen, praise ye the Lord. We are grateful and thankful for the many wonderful blessings and things that God is doing for us day by day. He is keeping us. He is restoring us. He is uh making sure that we are sustained in this pandemic and in this world. And listen, he is protecting us even when we don't know that we're being protected. How we thank God for his grace, his love and his mercy. Uh, listen, today is our uh, communion Sunday. So I want to go ahead and encourage you, uh, those of you who are not able to receive some of the communion elements uh, to go ahead and get whatever uh, breads or crackers or any kind of bread that you may have around the house or any bread substitute and any uh, any juice, milk, water, whatever kind of liquid uh, wine substitute that you have so that when we get ready to uh, engage in communion, we can all engage together uh, because this is the day that God says to us because he has given it to us, remember me and remember everything that I have done for you. And so as we get ready to enter into our worship time today, isn't it wonderful to enter into worship knowing that God is holy and he is the holy of holies. And so Marcus is going to come and he's going to play for us this morning, holy, holy, holy. Oh, let's hear it and let's worship together. Hello, hello, hello. How do you do? At Pleasant Grain Baptist Church, we're so glad to see you. We're exalting Christ, embracing community, and engaging culture. Hello, hello, hello from Pleasant Grain. Good morning, Pleasant Grain Baptist Church. Today I'll be playing Holy, 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 and it's me, our oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer.
Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this service. Please remember to get the Pleasant Green Baptist Church. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Hey, brothers and sisters, isn't it wonderful to know that it's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's not my neighbor, it's not my friend, it's not my foes, it's not the people who I'm familiar with, but it is me, it is me, it is me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer and how we need prayer in our country and in our communities, and yes, even in our church today. We are in so much in need of prayer. And we thank God for Marcus continuing to bless us uh, with uh, his gifts and his talents uh, as our music director and giving us this music in this pandemic time. We're thankful to God that you all have joined with us again, either through Facebook, YouTube, or our call-in line. We're, uh, and we're even now on Instagram. Uh, so we're making sure that we're getting the message out there even to the younger generation. So thank God for all of the, all of you who are with us today as we get ready to jump into the message for today. Remember, we're still focusing on the idea that, uh, that there is a call waiting for us. And that call is coming from God himself. God is calling us. We've, we've answered the call and now he is, he is imploring us to activate that call in our life because he has been calling since creation. He called Christ, he's calling his converts, and he's always calling with clarity. Answering that call is one wonderful, great thing that we can do. Activating and acting on that call requires something more of us, requires something greater and deeper of us in our pilgrimage with Christ and our walk with him and our talk with him. What does he want us to know about activating his call to us today? If you have your Bibles or, or your, your phones or whatever devices that you are using, if you will turn to John chapter 17, that's the place where our text finds us today. And we're going to read verses 14 through 24 in your hearing uh, for today. This is that place in which J Jesus is getting ready to uh, go and to leave his disciples. In the middle of this discourse, he breaks out in prayer. Hear his prayer. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given to me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and them and me, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. What a powerful prayer that Jesus makes as he's getting ready to depart uh, from his disciples and fulfill his ministry on earth and getting ready to put them into a deeper love and a deeper ministry in their own sin. In this passage, Jesus is praying mightily for the disciples. He's about to be separated from them. He's sending them out into the world, a world that hates both him and them to share a message with the world about the only one who truly loves them. And that's him. He's praying that the world that hates him would understand and see the love that he has for them. And he wants to see that love through us. He prays that the world might see him through them. 
as bad as they are, as difficult and as dysfunctional and as, as seemingly hard-headed and can't get it and can't grasp it and can't understand it and don't always do the right thing, as bad as these disciples are, that they might have the same fellowship with them as they have had with him. That's what Jesus is praying for in this passage. Even a fellowship with those who currently hate them and him. So today, brothers and sisters, God wants us to know that it is highly important that those who have been called as converts of Christ activate that call in the call to communion, in the call to communion. Yes, God is calling us to a communion relationship with him and with them. Whoever the them in your life is, the them might be friends, it might be family, it might be those who you consider familiars or your Facebook pals or your Twitter followers or your, in, your Instagram onlookers. Whoever you are called to be in communion with, God, God through his son, Jesus Christ, who prays this prayer wants you and I to know that there is a communion and a fellowship that you need to have in them, uh, with them, because it is in him first that you have that. And so John 17 puts us that into us. And as we look at this passage and as we explore this and unpack this, one of the first things I want you to see in this message today is that God's calling to communion means intervention. Yes, it means that at some point and at some place, we have to engage in intervention for somebody or something in our life. Remember here, go back to verse 14, where he says, look, Lord, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying, Father, that you are to take them out of the world. I don't need you to take them out of the world. That would be impossible. If we took them out of the world, they could not fulfill their purpose that you have given to them. But I need you to protect them from the evil and the evil one. I need you to put your arms around them, Heavenly Father, that they will be protected from the wiles and the evils and the wickedness and the waywardness of the world. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Yes, they have to exist in this world. And brothers and sisters, we all have to exist in this world that is not our home. And Christ says, I want you to know that I'm intervening for you and I'm inter and this intervention is on your behalf because you are not of the world just as I am not of the world. And he wants you to understand brothers and sisters that because we are not of the world, there are some challenges we're going to face. There are some critiques and some criticisms that we're going to face. You heard him say in the very first, in the very first verse, the world hates them. The world hates the fact that there is somebody who sits high and looks low and judges the entire world. The world hates the fact that there is an operational standard of truth that we must uh, follow and fall under if we are going to survive in this, in, these, in this world. It is not just societal's view. It is not just the scientific thing. It is not just the majority way. It is not just who gets, who gets to be in the right position at the right time. God has set a standard for our life. And Jesus wants his disciples to know, he wants you and I to know that if we have come to him and because we have been converts of his, we understand that the world is going to hate us. The world is going to hate us to such a degree that the world is going to try to do everything the world can in order to distract us and discredit us and detour us and prevent us from doing what God is calling us to do. And so those interventions that Jesus is giving in this prayer is an intervention to stabilize them in their, in their thinking, in their talking, in their walking, to give them a place of stability, a standard of truth that they can hold on to, something you can claim as rock solid in your life, something that will help you to keep your, keep, keep your feet on the, in the right place, we need stay, to be stabilized in this time. Listen, we have just come through a, a, a destabilized uh, 
four years and a destabilized election. And there needs to be some stabilization in this country, but there needs to be some stabilization in your own community, in your own church. And yes, brothers and sisters, there needs to, sometimes a house needs to be stabilized because there's so much stuff going on in our homes and in our families that we need to have a standard that will stabilize us and keep us protected from the things that are trying to discredit and destroy us. And not only is there an intervention that's needed to stabilize us, there's also an intervention needed to steady us. We need to be steady in the, in the, uh, in the sight of our haters who are hating on us all the time. We need to be steady and and stable in, in the fact that people are looking at us and looking for us to stumble and to fall and to fall by the wayside and to do something. They're ready to pounce at a moment's notice at one line that we could say wrong, one thing that we could do wrong, one, one moment of not walking in the spirit, but walking in our uh, selfishness and walking in our flesh. Your haters are going to hate on you. Your haters are looking for opportunities to hate on you. But the God, the word of God gives you a steady uh, stream and a steady beat that you can keep going to. Jesus says of his disciples, uh, I'm not praying for you to take them out of the world, God. I'm just praying that you will steady them and you will stabilize them. Keep them from the evil of the world. Keep them from the evil one of the world. And what I have given to them is your word to steady them. Your word, your standard, your scriptures that will help them to stabilize their life and steady their resolve to continue to doing the work that God is and calling all of us to do through the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. You all heard Marcus play the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. God is a holy God, and he has a standard that he wants us to follow, and that standard will stabilize us and steady us in the middle of destabilized times. It will help us to deal with the situations and circumstances that are uh, accosting us everywhere that we go. We know that there are things that are happening in our country, happening in our community. We know about coronavirus. We've been dealing with coronavirus now for a full year, a full year since the first cases came in here in the United States. And yet we are still steadily trying and trying to do greater and greater things. Yes, we want to be back in the sanctuary. Yes, we want to be back with our friends celebrating and gathering. Yes, we want to be able to go to the mall and go to the school without fear of contracting a virus that could kill us and do bodily harm to us. Yes, we need some steadiness in our lives. And yes, there's a vaccine on the way and many, many more being vaccinated every single day. But how many of you all know, listen, that vaccine is not the thing that will steady you. The vaccine is not the thing that will stabilize you. It is standing on the promises of a steady and sure God who has given us his word and his spirit to operate in. That kind of intervention on the behalf of Christ to stabilize and steady us, that is what is going to help us to be successful, even in the middle of this pandemic that we're dealing with. And so brothers, not only that, uh, God not only uh, calls us to communion, meaning that Jesus is intervening as an intervention for us, but God's calling to communion means an invitation for us. Here in John 17, verses 17 through 21, we see an invitation uh, that Jesus offers in his prayer, uh, in his intercessory prayer to God on our behalf. Watch what he says. He says, sanctify them through your truth. And then he says, your word is truth, not my truth, not your truth, not somebody else's truth, but God's truth. God truth only is the truth that we can be sanctified through. It is not the societal truth. It is not the majority decisions truth. It is not the president's truth. It is not the Senate's truth. It is not the Congress's truth. It is not the governor's truth or any of the, your, your state or local legislators' truth. It is God's truth that will sanctify us and get us through the situations of our lives. As you have sent me into the world, Jesus says to his father, 
even so I am sending them into the world. God is sending us into the world, even though the world hates us, even though the world wants to destroy us, even though the world wants to discredit us, even though the world wants to detour, detour us, he is sending us into the world to give the world an invitation so that they too might join him. He says in verse 19, I'm sending them into their world. And so for their sakes, I sanctify myself, not one, but not, no one is sanctified but God. No one but God has the power and the authority to sanctify themselves. And so Jesus is saying, I sanctify myself so that they will understand that I am the same as you. We have separate functions, but we have the same essence. We have this, we're equal in all of our spirituality. I am God, you are God. I am God sending my sons out into the world that they might be sanctified through the truth. And I'm not just praying for these alone. I'm praying for those who will believe on me through their word. Oh, brothers, that's a powerful statement. Jesus says, I'm not just praying for these few little disciples that I've spent three, uh, three years with. I'm not just praying for these a hundred or so persons that have followed me around and these folks who have uh, been with me for this time. I'm praying for everybody who is going to believe on me through their word because we're sent out. They're going to send an invitation. I'm inviting them to be in partnership with me and they're going to invite others to be in partnership with them so that the whole world will know that I am in you and you are in me because he says in verse 21, that they all might be one as you father are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us. Jesus is sending out an awesome invitation that, they, that we can have the same kind of relationship uh, that he and the father had, that we as his children, as converts, as those who respond to the invitation, and those who go out and make other disciples, that they can have the same kind of relationship that Jesus has with the Father. And why does he want that same kind of relationship? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus says, I want them to in, in, invite them into this relationship so that they will believe that you sent me, so that they will understand why you sent me, so that they will know that in your sending me, you are sending me out of your love for them to save them and secure them in all. And so this invitation, brothers and sisters, this is an invitation to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be put into a different place and a position. Yes, the world is trying to, to make you look like the world. The world wants you to be the same way that the world is. The world does not want you to be set apart. The world wants you to do everything that the world is doing. The world wants you to look like the world, live like the world. It wants you to experience the world, lie like the world and experience all of the lust of the world. The world does not want you to be set apart. The world does not want you to take a stance on your sanctification. The world does not want you to decide that you're going to live your life according to the standard of the word of God, which can sanctify your life and put you into a different position. I know because every, I know that you hear people say, well, this is what works for me and that's what works for you. And this is how we do it over here. And oh, a little bit of this won't hurt you. And a little bit of this won't bother you. A little white lie won't do anything to you. A little bit of this, but that is not God's standard. That is not God's word. That is not how God has set you apart. God has set you apart to such a way that everything you do, that you exercise holiness in your life and your, your, your holiness comes because you're sanctified and washed and poured over and poured through and you're renewing your mind day by day by the word of God, which has the ability to make you more and more righteous as you release yourself into that word and get that word in your life. And so, yes, brothers and sisters, this is an invitation to be set apart, to be sanctified in God. But it is not just an invitation to be set apart. He wants you to be set apart from the world. He doesn't want you to be isolated from the world. 
He doesn't want you to be standoffish from the world. He wants you to go into the world and be something more, be something greater, do something special, be great in this world, be special for him, be something more than you ever thought about being before. No, I'm not talking about being the top basketball player or the top athlete or the top artist or the top uh, person in, on your, in your field. I'm talking about doing something that's going to give you the greatest level of significance in all of your life. And that is to go into the whole world and tell somebody what good things God has done for you. He says, look, it is simple. I am sending you out into the world and I'm sending you so that you may tell the world and show the world how you believe that you said that he was sent. And so that the world can believe through you that he was sent. Brothers and sisters, we have an awesome responsibility and an awesome requirement, an awesome task and an awesome opportunity to respond to the invitation to be set apart and to be something more, to be sanctified by the word of God and the power of God and to do something special through that word and through the power that God is giving to, into us. And so yes, the intervention is there because God desires to protect us and keep us and, and from the harms and the ills of the world. And yes, the invitation is there because God has a purpose for us in our lives to go out into all the world and to be alongside with him. And then God's calling to communion means that there's an inauguration for us. Yes, brothers and sisters, I know we just celebrated a presidential inauguration, but this inauguration into fellowship and relationship with God and communion with him and communion with fellow brothers and sisters is so much beyond what the presidential inauguration will. If you think that was a show, if you think what you saw uh, on all of, in the concerts and in, in, the, uh, in the ways that they put the uh, inauguration on, if you think that was a glorious moment, if you think that was something to shout about, all you ought to see the inauguration that Christ talks about in this prayer. He says, the glory which he gave me, I have given to them. Now stop and think about that for a moment. Remember, God, the glory which was given to Christ was a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue in heaven and on humanity will confess. And even the those in hell will confess that he is Lord. That is a glory that is unsurpassable by anything else in the whole wide world. There are thrones and dominions and diadems and everything that has been given to Christ because Christ fulfilled his mission in the world. His glory is available and waiting for us to in our inauguration when we get to go and shout and be a part of the inauguration on that great getting up morning, in that time, in that season. And yes, brothers and sisters, it does not require us transitioning from earth to eternity to receive the glory. We have already received the down payment of the glory because we have the Holy Spirit who has come to live with us and come to be with us and walk with us and talk with us and tell us who we are. He says, the glory which you gave me when I, I have now given unto them. I've given them my spirit and I've given it to them, not so they can be selfish, not so they can show off, not so they can strut their own stuff, but that they may be one, even as we are one. Notice how Jesus in this prayer, in each and every instance, in the intervention, in the, in the invitation, and in the, even in the inauguration, continues to come back to this idea of oneness, of unity, and you've heard that talk of oneness and unity in our country. We need to be hearing that in our community. We need to be hearing that in our churches because so many of us are divided about so many things. We are scattered and thrown apart and thrown away and thrown off from each other in our own communities, so much so that a neighbor doesn't know a neighbor. You live right next door to somebody and don't even know their name. There's no way we can have unity in the community if we don't have 
to get to know the people who live right around us, get to know the people who are in our churches, getting to know the people in our community so that ultimately, and yes, even getting to know the people who don't necessarily look like you. Jesus says in verse 23, I in them and you and me, that they may be made in complete unity, that the world will know that you have sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. The world will know that you have sent me, that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I will that these you have given me be with me where I am. Another inaugurational moment. God, Jesus is saying to God, his father, Lord, I want them to be with me. When I get, when they get through with the work that they're doing there, they will be here with me. That they may behold my glory in all of its fullness. They have not beheld all my glory, even on that mountain of transfiguration, when Peter, James, and John got to see me shimmering white, they still could not behold the entirety of my glory. I want them to be at the inauguration where they can behold the entirety of my glory, which you have given me, and the glory that I'm going to give to them because they have followed me and they have fellowshiped with me and they have been here with me for all of this time. For you loved me before the creation of the world. Wow, what an awesome inauguration that'll be available for us both here and in the hereafter in the inauguration of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell and live with us and in the inauguration of beholding the glorious majesty of Christ who was with God before the foundation of the world, before the world was created, we get to see the formal beginning that seals us with Christ, that secures us with Christ, that satisfies us in Christ, and that sends us for Christ. Brothers and sisters, our formal beginnings, just as the presidential inauguration gave him the formal authority to go to work, our inauguration as converts of Christ is given to us so that he may send us into the world with a passionate heart and a purposeful mind and a productive spirit to do the things that he has called on us to do. And that is for us to make sure that we're intervening for others. That is to make sure that we're inviting others so that they can be a part of the inauguration ceremony along with us that will seal, secure, satisfy, and send more into the society so that Christ's inauguration can be the best, the brightest, the biggest, the baddest, the fullest of everything all. And that, my brothers and sisters, is it where we're trying to go. God is still calling us, even through Christ's intercessory prayer, to be one with him and to intercede for others as Christ has done for us. He's calling us, y'all, but he's not calling us for us. He's calling us so that we will see and he can show his glory that he had with the Father from the foundation of the world. His call is still waiting. Will you activate it in your life? Will you make sure that you are intervening on the behalf of others, praying for others to be protected from the evils of the world, praying for others to uh, understand and peru and, and understand and know the word of God for themselves so that they can be with him? Will you invite others to study the word of God, to receive the word of God in their life so that they can be stabilized and steady in their life, so that they can be secure and sure of what's going to happen in their life, so that they can have uh, something special happening in their life, so that they can do more than they've ever done in their life for the kingdom of God. That's why we're here. That's our purpose. That's what God is calling us to do. Brothers and sisters, can we do it? Yes, we can. Let's pray together. Lord, draw, me, draw us closer. Lord, draw us closer to you than we've ever been before. And as you draw us closer to you, 
draws closer to you for the sole purpose that we might draw others and that drawing others closer to you is simply, you've given us the secret of how to do it, how to reach the masses, men of every birth. For the answer, Jesus gave the key. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Lord, help us to draw others closer to you by lifting you up so that the whole world may see the glory which you have, the goodness which you have demonstrated, the godness which you are possessing, and that which you have done to guard our lives against the evil one, that we all might be one and that we all might behold your glorious inauguration. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, brothers and sisters, we want to extend the invitation right now. There might be one who have heard this message, whether you're on Facebook, call in line, or YouTube. You might be saying, today is your day to be answered the call into communion. You might be the one who someone has been intervening before. You might be the one who this invitation is for. You might be ready to get your inauguration garments ready. If that's you, we want you to connect with us using our church app, using our church email, or using our church phone number. Contact us. Let us know that you're ready to begin your journey and we'll be ready to walk with you and teach you and, and show you the way of God in, our, in all of your life. If you pray this prayer with us, Lord, God, I need you in my life. I need your Holy Spirit to take charge of me so that I can do something special for you, so that I can do more than I've ever done before, so I can be sanctified in your truth. So help me, God, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, you pray that prayer, you connect with us, we'll get you in touch with the right people in the right places. You might be somewhere else and might need to connect with a local church. We'll help you do that wherever you are, amen. Amen. Hey, brothers and sisters, again, it is our communion Sunday. Yeah. By now, we hope that you have gotten your elements, uh, your bread, your crackers, whatever you have. It is a wonderful time knowing that Jesus was praying this prayer on his way to the cross. And as he prayed this prayer, he had prayed this prayer right after he had uh, broke, broken bread with his disciples. And he said to them, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And they took the bread and they ate together. And after the same manner, they took the cup that Jesus, after he had given thanks, he blessed it. And he said, drink you all of this. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you drink it, you do remember my death until it, I come again. And then he goes on to say something else. He says, I will not drink it with you until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Oh, brothers and sisters, at the great inauguration, we're going to toast to the, to the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He who shed his blood is going to give us the wine of joy. And we, so we will no longer have to drink the vinegar of sorrow. Let's drink together. Oh, and brothers and sisters, if I could sing, I would tell you that after they had, after they had supped and after they had drank, they went out and, and they sang a hymn and they went out into the garden. And there Jesus began his priestly prayers. Listen, how grateful we are, how thankful we are, uh, again, that you have continued to uh, partner with us in this ministry of virtual ministry. Uh, we thank God for you. We thank God for your uh, presence. We thank God for your participation, and we especially thank you for your partnership. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, we continue to need, solicit your support and solicit your prayers for this ministry. Please connect, connect with us through our church app and our church website. Uh, con continue thinking and praying in your heart of how you can contribute to our ministry. Uh, if you're a part of a local church, we definitely want you to be tithing there and giving a good offering there. And if you have something extra that you 
uh, would love to share with us, we'll be glad to receive it. We'll be great stewards of it and we'll put it to God's use that we might continue to share the gospel uh, with uh, those in the church, those in the community and those in the whole wide world. Uh, you may drop off those, comp uh, mail those contributions to, to our church address. You may uh, connect with us on our online giving platforms to support us in that way or uh, any way you so choose. Uh, we will be glad to receive. Now let's hear the benediction for the day. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace. Now let the whole church say, amen. Brothers and sisters, wear your mask, wash your hands, Watch your distance, watch your back. There's some strange stuff still happening out there and watch out for your neighbor. And then we'll see you next time.